Paul was glad to be back in Kirkland. He knew a lot more about life than when he had left Kirkland and moved to Oakport. Paul was grateful to Oakport in spite of his decision to leave. Oakport facilitated his informal education. He learned about people, but he concluded he would be a misfit anywhere. But he could accept that. Contemplation and prayer slowly allowed him to accept what previously had seemed intolerable. Grief, loneliness, hopelessness. He knew he was a creation of the not much known causal realm, that he was guided and provided for on his purgatorial pilgrimage. It was often difficult, but there was also grace. There were experiences of transcendent awareness and alternate understanding sometimes, other times confusion and suffering. But most of what he learned, he learned on his own. There were years when he needed the old wisdom church. But now, prayer and contemplation would suffice. Paul developed enough capacity for contemplation and prayer that by the time he moved from Oakport, he no longer needed the sacred space of the old wisdom church especially because in Kirkland he had his own apartment which gave him ample privacy. But Lucky's Diner became his second home. Not only did he work 50 hours a week there and ate most of his meals there, but often he just spent hours of his off time sitting at a table with a cup of coffee. Co-workers and customers said hello and once in a while sat down and joined him. It was a way of not being totally alone. The diner was a world unto itself, it seemed. He knew it well. He was part of it. Although he spent a lot of time alone in his apartment, at times anxiety pushed him into town. There were places he was a regular. The Silver Dime Cafe, and sometimes in the evening, the Double Nickel Bar and Grill. A relatively large office building built in 1922 was renovated about 12 years after Star City Cabaret opened. The Kirkland Institute for Cultural and Social History of America focused on the first half of the 20th century. It contained a museum, a library, a movie theater, and a small concert hall. The public could watch old Hollywood films, hear music performed, folk, jazz, big band, from early and middle 20th century. But the Institute also published a quarterly journal with articles written by its resident scholars. It was not just the extensive library, but the cultural offerings that informed the resident historians. They were not expected to unearth undiscovered facts, but to write works of interpretation and presentation for an intelligent but not necessarily academic readership. The successful entrepreneurs that benefited from the tourists and visitors to Kirkland supplied considerable financial resources to start the Institute. The Kirkland Institute gave the town a benefit of association with a purpose that was beyond entertainment and enjoyment. In other words, a higher value purpose. Thus the business owners felt mutual approval from the community of contributors to such a worthy endeavor. It was also hoped the town would gain some prestige from the Institute. The movies and concerts were popular with some visitors. Gina Fiorello taught American history at community college. Although not the highest credentialed candidate for the position of resident scholar, her aunt was half owner of a large casual Italian restaurant in Kirkland and a major contributor to the Institute. 
But Gina presented herself with restrained passion at the interview and had many ideas for future articles for the forthcoming journal. And her writing examples showed wit and clarity. She got the job. It did not pay much, but Gina was grateful to be leaving the community college. Paul's schedule varied, but if he had hours in the evening or late evening that he was not working, he often was at the bar of the Double Nickel. The place had many individual small lamps for the tables and the bar, otherwise it was relatively dark. This gave the illusion of privacy, so he sat at the bar alone drinking his bourbon as slowly as possible. He overheard parts of conversations. He was not totally alone. Other people were regulars, but usually they knew each other and had conversation. Gina worked late and had her dinner there most evenings, and she had a couple pints of ale and talk before going home alone. It was not too long before Paul fell in love with her, though they had never talked. But he was used to unrequited love. But he somewhat could detach himself from the feelings. But as long as he kept going to the double nickel, it was going to be a chronic condition. Gina was avoiding romantic relationships for her own reasons. Friendships were enough. Gina was a devout Catholic. She went to Mass almost every day. In late adolescence, she had a boyfriend that she went all the way with. But after a month, she broke it off after having nightmares and constant guilt. She went to confession every week for a year before she started to feel the guilt lift. The priest gave her in instructions to recite the rosary for an hour every day, hoping that the Blessed Mother would console her. He was a little afraid that Gina could go over the edge. She was so distraught. Gina was not afraid of going to hell. She was convinced the church and Jesus had forgiven her. But she was afraid of hell because her nightmares had given her a glimpse of the horror. And that fear was not erased by the attribution of forgiveness. It was fear of an aspect of reality. Only an awareness of a greater reality can subsume such a horror, greater than normal human awareness. The Beggar's Vault was a large space on a side street. Most of its customers were locals. They served vegetable stews and whole grain bread at cheap prices. It was run by the Universal Creation Church of Kirkland, which was a storefront church on another side street. Passers-by could look through the window at the rows of chairs and on a low stage at the back if church was in session. A large man with long red hair was preaching. A sign on the window stated, visitors welcome anytime. At times the preacher sat down and a few singers and a few guitarists came on stage and performed. Much of the time the congregation sang along. The church believed there were many ways to know the Creator. But Steve Miller had a unique way of presenting spiritual philosophy that was popular, especially with young people who were disillusioned with the church they had been brought up in. And the worship music was folk-based and captivating. One evening, about two years after Paul left Oakport, Paul had just returned to his apartment after spending almost two hours at the bar of the Double Nickel. He 
He was in his chair, about to read a book, when a wave of despair washed over him. He did not cry, because if he let himself, he might get too loud and disturb others in the apartment building. So he controlled himself, but the feelings were intolerable. The grief was physical pain, but the hopelessness seemed to destroy any reason for his being alive. But after a while, enduring such distress, a paradox revealed itself. At one point, he was in despair. He could not escape it. It was inevitable. He had to accept it. And as if by a miracle, his distress dissipated and he felt calm. He had had enough past spiritual awareness and understanding to know what had happened. Acceptance is like a magic key. Resistance generates suffering. Acceptance allows grace. Of course, it is a difficult paradox. You cannot try and accept something in order to get it to go away. That is just resistance. Real acceptance means acceptance of a loss. Thus, resistance to having a loss, loss of love, for instance, is normal. Usually there is grief, sometimes fear, sometimes anger, when experiencing the loss of something but there is also usually lots of thought to try and understand, to try and figure out what to do, blame, self-judgment, etc. That's only when one observes the patterns of resistance, is conscious that that is what one's mind is doing, is there a chance that one can realize resistance is futile and acceptance is possible. Unfortunately, having a moment of acceptance and moments of grace, that does not mean resistance is gone. It almost always returns. Thus, the development of spiritual awareness is a very, very long process, a lifelong process of awareness development.